Good morning, and welcome to Lent devotion number three. Thought I'd find a different change of scenery this week, and I'm standing at the foot of our cross and our beautiful altar at St. Paul's. I am Pastor Gary Pomranke, and we are going to start our midweek devotion based on the study, Return to the Lord. And our theme verse from Joel 2.13 says, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So I hope you've enjoyed the first two devotions, and let's get ready to start the third. Let us pray. Precious Savior, as you ordered that mockery of a trial with slander and conjecture and false accusations being thrown at you, you were struck and spat upon. You have shown us how to turn the other cheek. Help us to learn to do the same when others revile us and say all kinds of false things about us, that our own words and actions may not be in vengeance towards others, but may show others the love that you have for all of us through patience and forgiveness and mercy. In your holy name we pray. Amen. The concept we're going to discuss this week, um, last week we talked about betrayal. Um, today we're going to talk about a need, another B word. But before we get there, let's share our scripture reading from Matthew 26, verses 56, or excuse me, 57 to 68. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard this blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered. He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? In case you hadn't figured out, the other B word that we're going to discuss today is blasphemy. Just one of the things the chief priest and the teachers of the law were trying to catch Jesus doing so that they could have a reason to put him to death. Blasphemy is words or actions that show disrespect for our God. Sometimes people be can become so blinded with hatred, as did the religious leaders in Jerusalem towards Jesus, that it is effortless to break the Eighth Commandment. Then as they attempt to justify their words and their actions and often magnify the blasphemy, resulting in serious damage or complete ruin of another's reputation. This is part of the scene of Jesus' trial, quote-unquote, before Caiaphas, the high priest, and the temple leaders. Now, I don't know if you've heard the term kangaroo court before, but it refers to a sham legal proceeding that gives the impression of a fair legal process. Jesus' trial fits this bill. Things happen so quickly that the council is not prepared to try Jesus when he is brought before them. Notice that Jesus is being led from the, from the proceeding to proceeding. 
He is passive. He is not fighting. He is willingly going from the arrest to the trial and to his crucifixion. He is willing because he knew it was predestined for him to walk this path for the sins of mankind. This brings us to discussion point one for the week. What are the charges that the chief priests are seeking to levy against Jesus? The answer is found in 2659, which reads, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Pause and think about that for a second. And then press play and we will discuss the answer. Well, the answer to our first discussion point is just this. The chief priest, Caiaphas, they were all trying to catch Jesus in some sort of sinful act this whole time. Now, we are told that specifically they were seeking the charge of false witness and a sentence of death. Of course, they found no evidence against this innocent man, a man without a sin blot or blemish. Just think about this. I talk about this in my messages from time to time. Jesus lived 33 years. He was sinless in every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every year of those 33 years. Think about that in contrast to us. We can't even go 33 minutes some days without sinning. But interestingly enough, in our reading today, though Jesus is not guilty of false witness, many declare false witness against Jesus, and they come forward to try and substantiate the claims that Caiaphas and the high priests are making. Our second discussion point for today is, of the false witnesses, whose words are recorded in Scripture? Two gave testimony against Jesus. Well, what did they say? This is a reference to Matthew 26, 61, which says the following, and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And then the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? Well, the answer for our second discussion point is based around the man saying, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Well, according to Deuteronomy 17, 6, the testimony of at least two witnesses had to be agreed before charges could be brought. The leaders were concerned about what would happen because the temple was their source of income and the presence of Jesus and his words threatened that. So even as they accused and even as they tried to figure out a way to put Jesus to death because he scared them, his testimony scared them. It made, me realize, made them realize how sinful they indeed had become, how corrupted they had become as leaders of the Jewish church and the Jewish people. Now, as like they are here in our time and in our day, in a trial, questions are asked of the witness and sometimes of the defendant. If the defendant does not answer the questions asked or respond to the accusation, then what happens? Well, the defendant looks guilty without standing up for himself and fighting the fight that would save him from the peril that he may face. That brings us to our third discussion point for today. Discussion point three is just this. The high priest stood and he asked Jesus, he faced him, and he waited for a response. And how does Jesus fulfill what was written about him in Isaiah 53, verse 7. Pause, and then I'll give you the answer. Well, Isaiah 53, 7 reads just this. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. His silence here is not enough to convince them of his guilt, as would normally take place in our day and age. And they did not have Jesus right where they wanted him. But in terms of an actual trial, it is not sufficient to convict Jesus of anything. They needed Jesus to speak himself and make some of these claims in their presence. And of course, it would not just be a claim, it would be the truth. The high priest demands, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ. That is recorded in Matthew 26, 6, 3. I hope you see how desperately these men who didn't understand who Jesus was, he wasn't the kind of leader that they wanted they wanted a leader who would come in and destroy their Roman oppressors. They wanted a leader who would lead them to the promised land, to, to be the promised and chosen race. And this humble Jesus, this meek Jesus, that's not what they were looking for. So when this guy from Nazareth is talking and so many people start following him and listening to his words, they had no choice in their eyes but to try him like a common criminal. Our discussion point four is this. This connects well to the question that Jesus had asked his disciples earlier and the confession that Peter had given. What was the answer? Well, in order to find that, let's read Matthew 16, 16. Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The question before this verse was Jesus asking Peter and polling him and saying, but who do you say that I am? And Peter's confession is the same, same phrasing that Caiaphas had used saying the living God. Although he shared that knowledge with his disciples, he didn't seem to want to share that with Caiaphas and this kangaroo court that he was a part of. Now this living God that he is, the word made flesh dwelling among mankind, God incarnate, is now facing those who accuse him falsely of wrongdoing. The question who he is and have only a, we have only a fleshly understanding, and they did as well, of where he came from. We knew who his parents were. We knew what town he was born in. And Caiaphas is asking Jesus to verify his identity as the Christ. Because many people don't know that Christ is not just his name, but the position of authority in which he holds. He is, and Christ was defined in the Old Testament as the Son of God. And Caiaphas, in this court, this mockery of a trial, were trying to get Jesus to confess himself and Jesus to identify himself as God's Son. Well, discussion point five revolves around how does Jesus answer Caiaphas's question? What is ironic about his inquiry? Did it sound familiar? Matthew 
Now here Jesus chooses to direct or to answer in the same indirect way that he answers Judas in Matthew 26, 25, and later on Pilate in Matthew 27, 11. Jesus says to them all, you have said so. All three of these men, Judas, Caiaphas, and Pilate, speak the truth about Jesus, but they do not know or believe it. Note that Caiaphas' goal is the same as God the Father's goal, the death of Jesus. He is falsely accused of the sin of blasphemy, which carries with it, in those times, a sentence of death. And that was what was called for by the people. They welcomed him with palms and laid their cloaks on the street as he entered the city. And just three days later, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. It just shows that the fickleness of people, the ability for people to not follow the word of God, to not follow what we are intended to do in this life and the effects that it has on the whole world. In closing, I want to remind you of a few things. We live in a world that's uncertain. We live in a world that has lost its connection with Jesus. I remember growing up in a small town in Upper Michigan where almost everybody I knew went to church. Their families were rooted in the Word, and their families knew who God was. They certainly knew who Jesus was, and they knew what he did for all of them. I don't see that in the world that we live in now, and it's a sad, sad thing. Because in this world, there is only one thing, one thing that can save us from an eternity in hell, and that is our faith in Jesus Christ. Through his righteousness, through his victory over death, and our faith in him, that is the only way in which our God looks at us as worthy of an eternity in heaven. So let us never forget that. Let us strive to reach towards previous days in which we were rooted in the faith, we were rooted in the word. I have found in my life that as I have strayed from my time in the word, my thoughts have strayed from the things of Christ. We need to surround ourselves with people that will help us in our walk with Christ. We must surround ourselves with people who know Christ, but we also must minister to those people that we are around because they may not know who he is. They may not know what's different about you as a Christian. That is, if you are walking the walk. They should see something different in all of us. And I pray that is the case with you all. This has been our third devotion in our Lenten series. excuse me, And I will be back next Wednesday to record our fourth. So I would ask that as we close that you please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, it is with great sorrow that we look upon your sham of a trial and hear the false witness against you who are without sin. Help us when we are haunted by false testimony against us and remind us what you endured for our sake. Give us the strength, the courage, and the faith when our enemies say all kinds of false things against us on account of you knowing that, you are, that we are blessed by you who are truly the Christ, the Son of the living God. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may, may we confess this always, but with faith and love, firmly believing and holding on to the saving faith in you, even unto death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is Pastor Gary Pomeranke of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Mechanicsville, Maryland, a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Congregation, and I pray you blessings on your week.